This episode of Push to Smart contains spoilers for the Bioshock series, including the most recent DLC, Burial at Sea, Episodes 1 and 2. Welcome back to the Push to Smart water cooler, where we are prepared to finally say goodbye to Irrational Games' would-be magnum opus de facto swan song Bioshock Infinite Burial at Sea. The second part of Burial at Sea puts us in the shoes of Bioshock Infinite's heroine, Elizabeth, leaving behind her dream of Paris, Elizabeth and the player venture back to Rapture for one final adventure, fraught with just as many twists and turns as the original Bioshock Infinite. Almost (laughs) as if they have something to prove. Yeah, funny how that works. (laughs) Yeah, so let's just go straight into Dream Paris, which was one of my favorite parts of the DLC. (laughs) It's like you knew it was a dream, but at the same time, it it really seemed like they were playing into that Disney princess joke that has followed Elizabeth around since, I think, they showed that um, clip of her dancing on the beach. Yeah. And so that was kind of fun, though at the same time, it was like, is this self-aware, or is this just more of the same? But But then once the little bird, like, gets on her (laughs) finger and starts singing, it's like, oh, they know. This is totally... Yeah, oh, they totally know, right. Um, But one of the things... Obviously, very Beauty and the Beastie, very bonjour, Mm -hmm. bonjour. Yeah, Um, (laughs) I wanted to break out in a song. (laughs) Exactly. But um, the thing that I found most interesting about this is, you know, we talked about how Elizabeth, most of her knowledge is secondhand, and she equated the Vox Populi Revolution with Les Mis, and so a lot of her knowledge of France is obviously from books, and Les Mis in particular, and the little girl she greets during the Dream Paris is named Cassette which is one of the characters in Les Mis. Yes. Isn't that the um, more naive one, too? Yes. <laughs> uh, maybe yeah. they are more self-aware than I gave them credit for. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. And then, obviously, mm-hmm. it goes to v- it gets very spooky very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I- although I think the little, like, l'oiseau ou la cage, yeah. kind of, <laughs> that was too much, I thought. It was a little... Okay. I thought that worked because it was right after the bird lands on her finger, and, you're, and that's what really cues in. Like, okay, this is definitely a dream sequence, and then you immediately go to that, and you and you immediately know this is not going somewhere good. Yeah, and it kind of sets the stage for the rest of the episode. But yeah, you get to be Elizabeth finally. Mm-hmm. Was it everything you dreamed of? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I really enjoyed it. I was really worried from the the trailer they showed us, where they have this kind of dream booker mm-hmm. telling her what to do. But that ended up manifesting itself in a way that still enabled her adventure. Um, Like, I was really worried that it would just be, like, father saving the daughter from beyond the grave, which is what we see in things like Silent Hill 3 and other games that have these uh, female protagonists, but they're still kind of, their actions are still pretty much dictated, and the day is still ultimately saved by the father. Um, But even though his voice is there constantly, it's more asking these questions so that she has an excuse to speak tell us, the player, what's going on. Mm -hmm. So it's like, she is still the expert here. She's the one that still knows all the crazy particle physics stuff to put the machine together. It's just just giving her a diegetic reason to say it out loud instead of that really weird way that, like, superheroes (laughs) announce everything that they're doing. Right. (laughs) I, I loved how they continually showed us how knowledgeable Elizabeth was just about Mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, she was um, really in control, which was nice. Yeah, like Booker would be like, how the hell did you know that? And then she's like, let me tell you about physics, and I can do yeah. this, and I can do that. <laughs> and it was, like, really cool and mm-hmm. a nice change of pace. And I really actually liked playing as her. I don't know why. It was just really cool, I thought. And um, mm-hmm. at first I was like, oh, you can't be lethal at all because you have this crossbow, and so because you're a lady, you can't do it. <laughs> and then they give you a microwave gun, which makes you, like, explode people. Right? <laughs> And then I was like, maybe I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Which I had a little bit of mixed feelings about that. Like, um, the stealth element, I thought it was very straightforward, but it really, really worked. Uh-huh. And um, I really liked being able to use the crossbow, like, with the sound traps and things like that. Yeah. Um, I thought that worked really well. But um, before you get the microwave gun and you just have an actual gun, there's, like, this um, dialogue she has with the Booker voice in her head about what it means to take a life and how she might not really be prepared to do that. But then 
once the game like lets you loose after that conversation, you could totally just take the gun and shoot somebody, and yeah. there is no repercussions. And it's like, what was the point of that conversation? It reminded me a little bit of like Tomb Raider, where she struggles so much to take a life the first time, <laughs> and then she's like Rambo. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, glad we got that out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Now that my mm-hmm. conscience is clear, let's kick some yeah. ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, one thing I didn't really like is how repentant Elizabeth was, because yeah. she seemed so in control and so sure of herself in the first Barrel at Sea episode, mm-hmm. that for her to suddenly become so unsure and so and regret her actions in, in such a strong way as to feel like she needs to be redeemed, I don't know, it just felt like a kind of 180 that didn't yeah. have much merit to it. And it was strange because they really tried to explain it a lot. Yeah. And it was just like the exposition dump at the end of the first episode where it was like a lot of talking at you and a lot of jargon, but it didn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. So, like, she says a lot about how she feels guilty for leaving the little girl there to die, but it's like, did we really do that? Like, if she has this infinite um, awareness, it seems like that would be more in perspective to her because she sees all these different outcomes. It's not just focused on one singular outcome and this one singular little girl. And the way that they also just closed the doors on her felt a lot like kind of, it felt cheap and it really exposed the idea of the doors as a very, very much like a literary or gamey device. Like, this is how we justify, it it was cool and I was like infinite in, in the sense that like, this is how we justify multiple endings or the game over state. But at the same time, it, it's it's too easy. It's an e- it, it, it was used in um, Burial at Sea just kind of as a quick fix. Like, we can't really think of a way for her to be in the situation. So, door. And now she has no doors. So, there. You're stuck. Maybe I'm reading a little too much into it. And this is what really frustrates me, is that... Mm-hmm. The one thing that I really enjoyed about Bioshock Infinite was how their kind of thesis of the infinite universe's possibilities all tied between a Mm -hmm. lighthouse and everything, that was the redeeming factor for Infinite for me. Mm -hmm. And it felt very much like Ken Levine was opening himself up to a world of possibilities for future titles, and in this, it feels like he's closing it out because he's leaving the franchise, which seems very childish. Well, <laughs> I don't know when this was made, like, if they knew Irrational was closing or, um, like, where they were, but it was very strange the way it was suddenly, they, they worked so hard to make it come back to Jack, to Bioshock, and the idea that this was all to service the original and it makes this perfectly closed loop. Oh, I hate that so much. So that no options could come out of this universe. And it just, it like you said, it felt antithetical to what we learned in the end of the first or in the end of Bioshock Infinite and it, the, it annoyed me more in that like it seemed very passive aggressive towards Bioshock 2 <laughs> yeah which was not by Irrational Games but in a lot of ways was a far superior game mm-hmm. it was much better designed it had a, it dealt with a lot of the themes that Bioshock Infinite dealt with like the father daughter relationship the inherent racism of society in a way that was much more nuanced and subtle and more fulfilling and less racist and exactly <laughs> I, I mean i have to say one of my biggest pet peeves is uh retconning to make something like everything connect hideo kojima right. does this all the time <laughs> and um i i just i hated so much like flames on the side of my face kind of <laughs> Why would you... She's such a great character, Elizabeth, I'm talking about, mm-hmm. of course. And I feel like now she's just a tool to get Jack... I, mm-hmm. I don't know. I think it kind of made her more... Even more of a plot device than a character. Right. Which was especially strange. Did, did you watch the, um, like, previously on Bioshock thing before? No, because my boyfriend was there and he hadn't seen it. Or he hadn't <laughs> played Bioshock. And so... Okay. Um, I was like, no, I don't want to spoil it. And then the end of the game, he was like, what just happened? I don't understand. And I was like, well. Yeah. Um, well, like, both in that and then, of course, the end of the actual DLC, it makes, like, the good ending of Bioshock the only ending, which seems to defeat the entire purpose of the thesis that was proposed at the end of Bioshock Infinite. Mm-hmm. So it, it kind of tried to create this, like, uplifting, kind of bittersweet message that Elizabeth was dying to enable Jack, and that Jack would finally break the circle that was, um, when would it be unbroken, that we heard about so much in the first Bioshock Infinite. But then you could play Bioshock 
and totally give in to the objectivist ideology and bring the splicers to the surface to destroy the world. Like, it was, it just, it didn't work thematically <laughs> with anything that came beforehand. <laughs> there, there was just so much that I disliked about this. I mean, I will say that I loved playing as Elizabeth, and it was great to get mm-hmm. back to Rapture. Um, I really hated that Elizabeth has to sacrifice herself so mm-hmm. that a man can come in and save everyone. <gasps> I didn't even think about that. And also, Daisy has to sacrifice herself so a white woman can sacrifice herself so that a white man can fix everything. <laughs> it was just like oh my this... God! <laughs> a matryoshka of, like, problematic <laughs> sacrifice. Which is hilarious, because it really, like... It was so funny playing through that scene with Daisy because it was like this subtext that we criticized for like a whole episode. Mm-hmm. The idea that Daisy and her struggle ultimately serve as Elizabeth in her coming of age story becomes the actual text. I know, and it's just and- like <laughs> it, it, it was so obviously backpedaling. Yeah, like, but backpedaling this, to what? And he was like, oh, I know how to make this better. And yeah, it's like, no. It the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was actually playing it, and because my boyfriend knows just how strongly I feel about Daisy, he was like, okay, stop what you're doing. I need to know exactly what you're feeling right now. Oh. <laughs> and I was just kind of like, Ugh. I mean, I kind of, in a very yeah. shallow way, I like that she she has a choice and she's aware of right. what that means to her, but I also don't buy that shit. I don't buy that Daisy yeah. would rise up, and why would she sacrifice herself so that a white woman could... That just seems antithetical to her cause. Yeah. I, I mean, ugh, it was one of those things, like, you're watching... Like, I, I, I kind of ruined this for you because I texted you when I was playing, like, hey, Daisy's back! <laughs> and then you're watching it, and it's like, no! No, no! Stop! Yeah. <laughs> like, take it back, because it's like... It, you, it was one of those moments where the characters opened their mouth and you heard the, the writer's voice come through. Yeah. And you knew... And also, why would she trust the Latisse twins? Exactly! It just didn't make any sense. It was so frustrating. It was just like, no, stop, stop. (laughs) Just pull it back. You can turn back. (laughs) You're just making it worse. Yeah. That's kind of the name of the game, is just kind of (laughs) Barrel at Sea Part 2, making it worse. What are you doing? Okay, so we talked about how Elizabeth sacrifices herself. And also, mm-hmm. I have to say, for a character who Ken Levine says that he loves so much, she gets the shit beaten out of her a <laughs> lot. I mean, and not just yeah. in-game, but, like, knocked over the head, like, a billion times. <laughs> she almost gets lobotomized, and she dies yeah. twice. That's, like, every transition. It's like, I don't know how to get out of this scene. Let's hit her over the head with exactly. something. Exactly. <laughs> That's your progression uh, is yeah. Uh, um, I really did like the lobotomy scene. My toes were curling. Like I really loved the body horror part to this. That really took it back to the original Bioshock for me. It's like if you can't get the um, feel of pre-crisis rapture, at least get the like the apocalypse rapture right. And they totally did with things like oh my god. Yeah, I love the Steinman callback. It was just, it, I, I was, like, covering half the screen with my hand with, like, my one finger on the pause button. <laughs> I know. When they had, like, the needle up against, I was like, they're not going oh to do this. Gosh. They're not going to do that. Yeah. And then when he hits it, I, like, literally yelled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, it's not going to, ah! It was just yeah. bad. And then they bring the little girl out to yeah. show, like, if, in case you don't understand what it looked like here. Yeah. I was a little apprehensive that one of the first areas you go into is, like, a sex shop. So I was like, of course, because you're playing as a woman. But I felt like it still worked really well mm-hmm. in the world of Bioshock. And it, again, it really went into that body horror and really kind of played in that objectivist toolbox that Bioshock was so good at getting into and making that something that is so horrifying that, and integrating it into the horror iconography that we're used to in movies and games and things. So um, I thought that was really good. Another thing that I really liked, the big daddy little sister. Oh, yeah. Yeah. kind of sweet scene where the, you have to get the big daddy out of the way and they're both mm-hmm. kind of scared of each other and she's like you two need each other I don't know th- I thought right. that was very moving in a way it was sh- her view of it was quite bitter though because it, it was the whole thorn in the lion's paw thing as she yeah. s- says out loud as she's going past it to call back to her relationship with Songbird which is established to be quite abusive and detrimental to her whereas like kind of like you said like my view of the big daddies has always been kind of 
sympathetic. Mm-hmm. I mean, once you get past that hurdle when they're super scary in the first game, by the end of it, you really sympathize with them and empathize with them. And I found, like, in the second game, you know, I'd be walking. I think there's one part where you're walking outside and you look in and you see there's a big daddy fighting off splicers with a little sister hanging off of him. Mm-hmm. And I remember, like, feeling, looking at him, like, you go, guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I know what you're feeling. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it was like, it, you don't really have that. Or rather, I should say, I still have that. And so that didn't really, that connection didn't really work for me mm-hmm. in connecting it to the songbird for Elizabeth. Yeah. Because I was still very empathetic <laughs> to my big daddies. But, um, and then I guess we should, I don't know if we should talk about Su Chong here. Oh, God. And all the, <laughs> the, uh, yep. <laughs> I realize that it's supposed to be set, you know, in the olden days. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like it's not really like olden days it's like olden day Hollywood movie version of <laughs> yeah oh my god and when they started calling him the slant I was just like what <gasps> you can't do this I don't know where else to put this but I was really angry that they had us made us listen to the um, would you kindly break the puppy's neck audio diary again <laughs> I don't remember that. I don't oh, think I, to that. I found it again. It was in the original Bioshock, I think. Mm-hmm. You that are Bioshock 2. And then I found it again in one of the cells in Su Chong's office. Yeah. It was like, really? It was so great. We had to do it twice. Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, that's kind of my thoughts towards Bioshock Infinite and, you know, a single sound. Mm hmm. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, is there anything you want to say to say goodbye to Bioshock Infinite forever? Ah, good riddance. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's the thing is, like, the stuff that I did like about Bioshock Infinite has been ruined by this DLC. <laughs> so it's like, what do I like about Bioshock Infinite? Nothing. nothing. You leave me with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was seeing comments on, like, Twitter and Tumblr, like, this this ruined Bioshock Infinite, and it's like, hey, hey, hey. Bioshock Infinite did a fine enough job of doing that on its own. So that does it for Bioshock Infinite forever. We're done. They're not going to make any more. We're good. (laughs) Maybe we'll check out the next game. We probably will. Because Bioshock does this to us. But we have, obviously, very strong opinions. We would love to hear your very strong opinions. Thoughtly worded. Please don't hate us. In the comment section of our video... Please, also, if you like what you hear, or at least interested in what we say, subscribe to our videos, keep up with us, and look forward to our next episode, which is going to be awesome, but we don't know what it is. Look at that poodle. That poodle is the best part of the game. You go, poodle. Ken Levine can never ruin you.